As Tony said, um, I was uh, trained to be a signal processing uh, person and, and uh, co uh, communication theory. And uh, I've been doing that for a number of years. And a few years ago, let's say by now, it was eight years ago, I got interested in neuroscience. science. And, but my perspective uh, is very much as an engineer. And therefore, don't expect a neuroscience science talk. This is an engineering talk, yeah. and um, I have a little sliver in the domain of neuroscience, which we call neuroengineering. I mean, that's what I'm going to talk about, what we have done in this area. The title of the talk is uh, The Brain, the Circuit, the, the Dynamics of That, the Dynamics of a Brain Network. And another you know, possible title could be, you know, what are electrical engineers doing in this, in this particular domain? And as you, you all know, we are very good at building tools. And, and I'm going to talk about tools uh, that we can build and use in this particular domain. Now, uh, before getting started, I want to acknowledge all my colleagues because it is not proper to work in this area without collaborating with people who actually uh, deal with patients or deal with actual neurons. And uh, I've had the pleasure of collaborating with a number of different colleagues across the street in a medical center near Rice. And, uh, and uh, a couple of them are neuroscientists, and, and a couple of them are MDs that are working with different diseases and different patients. Today, I'm going to talk about the work that I'm doing with uh, Nick and Tandon, and in particular, I'm going to talk about the work of one of my graduate students, and uh, the work of a number of undergraduate students that have built a, a harder platform to implement some of the ideas that I'm talking about today. Okay? Now, um, if you're interested in more details, uh, and more, because this is a very high level talk, if you're interested in details of something that you've done, you can find that in these references at the bottom. Of course, uh, I don't expect you to remember these things, but if you look me up um, in Google Scholar or other, other formats like that, you could, you could find these references. They're all have been published. Now, let me step back for a second and talk about uh, uh, our brain and why are we interested in the brain. It turns out that uh, we have been interested in how our brain works for, for centuries, for uh, hundreds and hundreds of years. And um, for a long time, uh, we thought that our uh, intelligence, the seat of our intelligence is our heart, actually. And then uh, it took a long time for us to discover that it's actually not here, it's over here it's in our brain. And um, that has been known for a long time, and uh, the Greeks and, and the Egyptians were very much involved in that discovery. And um, it took a you know, long time for us to find out more. I mean, the progress was very slow for many centuries. And uh, you know, along the way, there were a couple of quantum jumps in our understanding of how our brain works and, and why it doesn't work in some cases. And uh, one of the credits should go to the fact that we finally understood how a cell works. A cell, a neuron, and, and its functionality. We, we understand now how it works, and it was mostly because uh, we discovered microscopes, and we were able to look deep in, in, a, in a particular cell. And then uh, we realized that it is actually not the, act, the one individual cell, obviously. It's just the collection and the population of cells that lead to a particular, popular, particular function. And then we realize that our brain is made out of um, millions of these neurons that work together as a circuit. But unfortunately, it's not these kind of circuits that we are very comfortable with. It is this kind of circuit that is uh, sort of highly connected and a, and a large population. And the problem is that it's very hard to get into uh, the, the tissues and sort of learn and understand and model individual neurons or population. And um, along the way, we learned that um, we could record from these neurons, and we could help understand, that would help us understand how, the, how our brain works by recording from them. And at the same time, we realized that because these are electrical circuits, we could also modulate them, we could also stimulate them, and make them change their functionality to some extent. Right? Therefore, that's where the cross between electrical engineering, in a way, and neuroscience comes in by trying to probe and trying to modulate our uh, different neurons. Now, it turns out that we don't have just many neurons. We have millions and millions of neurons. And as I said before, uh, if you look at the functionality of individual neurons, 
for the most part, they function very similarly to others. And the, once we learn and one, once we memorize something, it's not like the functionality of individual neuron changes, it stays the same. It does that the connection of the neuron, the circuit changes, and our, uh, our response to a stimulus is because of the connection, because of the circuit, not because of individual neurons. Right? For that reason, people have realized, OK, it's not just individual neurons. It turns out that our brain, as a human brain, typical brain, has around, let's say, 80 billion neurons. And, but more, and then these neurons are very small at in, in a micron level. And they're very, very low speed. The speed of operation is very low. And it just sounds simple that we are used to dealing with pentiums and, and processes that are much, much faster. But it turns out that their the slow sleep speed help us in some aspect, but still doesn't answer how we compute, how we memorize all that. And it turns out that the, all of these uh, complexities sit in the connections of these neurons. Even though we have billions of neurons, we have trillions of synapses and connections between neurons and networks of these neurons. And then what I'm going to talk about is the connectivity of these neurons and how the connectivity changes as we go to a healthy state or illness or learning and all that. And uh, there are different kinds of connectivities in this setting. There are anatomical connectivity, that means the actual connection between neurons. And those are often fixed and uh, often anatomical. And there's there another kind of functionality that's been uh, discussed in the literature, and that's called functional connectivity. That means the connectivity that actually is used by, by neurons and connecting together. And there's another kind of connectivity called uh, effective connectivity, which is basically the causal relationship between different neurons and, and how one population causes another population to fire and to sort of engage that other functionality. Therefore, when I talk about functionality, I'm talking about these two specific kind, kind of functionality, the, the, uh, connectivity, the functional connectivity and the effective connectivity. And for the most part, I'm ignoring anatomic connectivity as a, as a, as a paradigm for discussion. Now, in our understanding of neuroscience and all that, there are a number of grand challenges out there that we have very little information about. One of the ones that we are interested in at Rice is how neural connectivity relates to behavior. When we behave, how does our uh, neurons uh, work together? And then when our behavior changes, how that connectivity changes. And that's a very, you know, one of the grand challenges in, in this era. And um, we don't know. Because of the scale, we don't understand that very well. And uh, another one which along the same line is that how uh, our neurons transition, how our neuron circuit transition. When we are healthy, it has a one kind of connectivity, and then when it's unhealthy, it has a different kind of connectivity. And the question is that if we are in an unhealthy state, is it possible to modulate and bring the population into a healthy state? Healthy state? And these are all open questions. Open questions. Another one could be learning, that if we learn something, how does the connectivity changes? And if we memorize something, how does the connectivity changes? And then is there any way that we could erase memory and sort of untangle this particular uh, population of neurons that basically memorize a particular event, which could be an interesting challenge by itself. Now, at Rice, um, my group has been involved in a number of different topics in this, in this arena. Basically, we've been interested in, in uh, Parkinson, in aphasia, in, in epilepsy, a number of different applications, different disorders that, uh, that we are interested in understanding. And we are interested, we are interested in analyzing our brain in the largest, with the largest scale recordings, and also trying to modulate our brain, modulate the population of our brain, uh, to take it from an unhealthy state to a healthy state and all that. And today, in this particular talk, I'm going to just talk about one of those problems that you're, <coughs> one of those applications that you're looking at, and sort of give you some results and put it in the right perspective. And the one that I chose is the Epilepsy Project, which is kind of an interesting project and going to help us relate, you know, electrical engineering and, and uh, this particular area of problem. Now, what is epilepsy? We all, to some extent, know what epilepsy is. Epilepsy has been defined as a disorder that 
is includes unprovoked and frequent seizure, an unprovoked and recurring seizure. Basically, it turns out that a large percentage of population will have one seizure in their lifetime. And when you go from one seizure to two seizures, the number drops quite a bit. And of course, the number of individuals that have epilepsy is much smaller than the population that have one seizure in their lifetime. Right? Therefore, we're just talking about those who have a large number of, um, let's say, seizures in a particular week or month, and those are common definitions. And it turns out that even though we have a definition for epilepsy, it is harder to nail down the concept of seizure. What is a seizure? A seizure has been defined to be a condition that a population of neurons get synchronized and get high, become hyper excited, and then instead of one neuron, let's say, uh, exciting another one, and then the, that other neuron <coughs> inhibiting this one so that the, the whole process would come down, instead one excites the other one, and the other one excites this one back, and it goes through a cycle that gets each other more and more excited. There was a situation where um, there is abnormally excite, hyper excited state of a, in a population of neurons, right? And that is called a seizure. And the seizure could take many different forms, could be very, very focused, uh, sort of focused on a very, very, in a very, very small area, or could be a, a global seizure, basic, uh, covering the whole brain, basically, instead of one specific, specific uh, region. It could be that you have a seizure, and that all that means is that you, you, in your sleep, you're having the seizure behavior, seizure activity, or it could be that you're standing and all of a sudden you start falling down and going through a convulsion. These are all called seizures. Yeah. Now, um, among the sort of our, our understanding of the seizure and epilepsy, one of the questions is that, open question is that, how does a seizure begin and how does it spread across different uh, populations of neurons, and but most importantly, how does it end? How come all of a sudden, when a patient goes through a seizure, how come all of a sudden it ends? It just the patient comes down and then the, the seizure is over. None of these things are, are clear, and except in, in, in particular, the last one is very sort of unclear. We really don't have any idea how, there's no reason uh, fundamentally that it should ever end, that it does actually end. Now, among the, these kinds of concepts, we're going to focus on focal seizures because our game plan is to modulate and try to sort of bring it from a seizure state to a healthy state. That's our overall game plan. Therefore, it's very hard to manage to do that for a global seizure. Right? And this is just a picture that you can find on the web where this particular region of this particular patient seems to be responsible for the, for the, the epileptic behavior. Method. Now, uh, in this talk, um, I'm going to uh, sort of, instead of asking the question of how does a seizure start, how does it spread, how does it end, I'm going to sort of focus on a, a little bit more specific set of questions. One of them is that, uh, can we identify a, a region where the seizure starts and spreads? We call that region seizure onset zone, right? From the recordings, can you identify which population of, of neuron is, is responsible for a spread of seizure? Right? It's called seizure onset zone. And then the second question would be, can we predict the onset of seizure? Let's, let's say if, if the patient was epileptic, can we predict the onset of seizure and warn the patient, for instance, to stop driving or, or sit down and, 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 and something to help improve their, their lifestyle? Right? That's another question. This is a very very difficult question, as it, as it turns out. And then the last question would be, can we prevent the onset of seizure? Can we modulate that region of the, of the population of the, of the neurons to modulate and to sort of prevent the onset of seizure? These are basically the, the three kind of questions that, that I would like to pose and I'd love to see if we can have answers for them. It turns out that um, um, the first one, we have some interesting results that we've been working on for a while. I'm going to talk about that today. 
It turns out that the second one, uh, we have some initial results that uh, is one of the toughest problems in, in epilepsy. And we have some initial results that, that, that is promising, but it is uh, very initial stages. And the last uh, question, we have no answers for, and we haven't even gotten started on that on that route, but we have, again, we have a game. Now, what would modulation mean? Stimulation. In this case, in this case, it is stimulation. The, the, the conjecture is that um, because of the fact that it is uh, the, that region is going through a hyperexcited state, the conjecture is that if we modulate that or stimulate that region with a sort of very low frequency, low voltage stimulation, in, uh, maybe sub sub uh, like sub hertz uh, uh, stimulation, we may be able to calm that region down. That would be in contrast to other uh, techniques uh, like uh, different stimulation for Parkinson or depression that people have used uh, higher frequencies like 100 hertz or 150 hertz to stimulate the region, to stimulate the activity of that region. Here we're trying to sort of dampen that activity of the region. That's our conjecture. Basically. As I said before, we haven't started that process yet. It's the zone effect. Always the same in the patient, or does it vary? In all the patients that you're dealing with, is the same region. You could imagine that if there is a patient that would have different focal seizures at different regions, it would be very hard to sort of help that particular patient. Because, as I will say in a second, uh, <coughs> we're dealing with patients that do not respond to pharmaceutical solutions, and uh, their uh, number their backup plan would be to have resection. Resection of that region of the brain that has, is responsible for the seizures. And you could imagine that if that region changes, that option is off the table. Therefore, for all of the patients that, that you are dealing with, they have focal seizures in a, in a very specific region of the brain. And you're trying to create a solution that does not include resection. Any other question? I, have, I don't have a particular agenda today. Uh, you know, I'm just talking, and I would be happy to take questions in the middle of the talk, and, and then this is making the two way. Yes. You know, what distinguishes someone who has local versus global concept? Plus, like, they, they do MRI and other. No, but why is it that in some patients it's local, and in others it's. I don't know. They are asked that question of neurologists, they don't know either. And it just, you know, uh, a, a good form of disease versus a really bad form of disease. We don't know. I mean, there are many things about, you know, seizures and and, and things that we don't know, and that that's one of them. Now, uh, as I said before, uh, we are interested <coughs> in helping patients that do not respond to pharmaceutical solutions, and there are uh, millions of patients that do not. And uh, <coughs> our, you know what our game plan is to understand uh, the locality of the seizure, where the seizure happens, and see if we can understand the, the seizure, and, if we can, and then we can understand whether we can modulate them or that, and we're taking them at one step at a time. Right? Now, in order to understand seizures, and in, in order to understand activities of population of neurons, uh, there are a number of different ways of sort of interacting with uh, cells and trying to learn from them. Uh, the least uh, invasive one would be put the EEG cap and try to, to record from the regions. And all the way to this particular case, where it would be to uh, insert probes and electrodes in the tissue and record from a particular region in the tissue. Right? And you can imagine that that's quite invasive. And then the middle ground solution would be to uh, open up the skull and place electrodes on the surface of the brain and record from the tissues, but not in close by tissues, but definitely far away from tissues. And it turns out that um, uh, this technique, if you imagine that would be uh, limited because of the signal to nose ratio and the impact of the hair and then the skull and the tissues and all that. And then this would be quite invasive and would be maybe a good solution for some, some cases. But this sounds like a very reasonable middle ground. And it turns out that that has become a quite a common 
a form of, of the reporting um, uh, from these patients. And it turns out that's what our, our neurologist, uh, neurosurgeon friend does. And um, the way they do it is that they uh, have the patient in a, in a hospital for a week, and then they implant the, the electrodes, and then the patient stays in the hospital for a whole week, and then they record from, from, that, re from that region. They decide what side of the brain needs the electrode and what, what they should cover through other means like fMRI and other technologies. And then they do recordings for, for days and days in the hospital like that. And, um, and then if the patient has like five or six seizures in that period, that's great. And then if, believe it or not, if the patient doesn't have seizure for days, they put a disco light in the room and then they have strokes going so that to, to induce a seizure. Because the patient is there for, for that reason and they, they, they don't have a seizure. And that's what, that's, and then what they do today is that they put the electrodes there to understand the region uh, uh, where the brain is having a seizure so that maybe a week or two later they would have a resection of that particular region of the brain, which as you could imagine, that is the last resort uh, option for many, many patients, right? And then the way we are sort of thinking about this is that uh, what if we have a good understanding of the mechanism of seizure so that instead of resection, you could modulate and then and then um, sort of uh, uh, help the patient not going to seizures again. That's the, that's the basic idea. And as, as I said before, we are not there yet, right? Now, this is our, our, our uh, method of choice of, of recordings, and there are uh, so, some between 150 to 250 electrodes that, that are placed, and, uh, and these are the typical electrodes that we've used, and it is not a recording of individual neurons, obviously, it is in the, on the surface of the brain, and then it actually, each electrode would record from a population of neurons, and that in the, in the literature is referred to as local field potential, which is basically looks like a time series of, of activities, which is made out of a number of um, spikes of neurons, but they go on through the tissues and through the uh, dura, sometimes they, they remove the dura, and then uh, it's just a recording from the population. Right? And then this is basically how it looks like for, for many of the patients, for many of the data we have. Here I have sort of depicted some 30 channels over a time period, and this is a typical situation for a particular, this particular patient. And um, as you see here, um, it looks like, at least, that the patient is just maybe relaxing, and then goes through a seizure right in this time spot, in this time period. And, um, and that's the, the, the recording, as I said before, before the, it's called the local field potential. Uh, LFP, and it is, uh, uh, we have recording for days and hours and hours of recordings, and then if you're lucky, the patient will have four or five seizures in that piece. Now, <coughs> may I ask you? Mm. Sure. But you get information from the surface, mm. so how do you know where is the location? Yes, we don't know. I mean, uh, in some cases, they do put electrodes inside the tissue. They have insert electrodes, electro rods, and those are the patients that they know from other modalities that the seizure area is, is deeper in the, in the brain tissues, and then they put electrodes close to that area. And some of the data that I'm going to show are from those patients. And for some of these are patients that is closer to the surface, therefore the cortex area, and then uh, they do some fMRI type uh, recordings, they know it's in the cortex area, therefore it's closer to the surface, and they feel like that is uh, maybe the, the best option for that particular patient. These decisions are made by the surgeons, not by, by us. Decisions on the placement of the, of the next one. What does channel mean here? Is it the location? Channel basically is a spatial location of that electron. So you do something spatial observation? Absolutely. Both temporal and the spatial observation. And how many neurons is that aggregate? Probably millions okay. each electron, yes. Absolutely. <coughs> I ask you another question. In the brain, as far as memory and intellectual ability is concerned, pyramidal neurons. 
יש רק הרבה מאוד זה אפ של הספקים של הדירות. זה יותר דיפרנט לוקיישן. And when you can see that it's back in the middle of the world, but maybe it's not a source. Maybe, maybe. Uh, as I said, the location is determined by neurologist and neurosurgeon. If, if the seizure is in the uh, epi, for instance, hippocampus area, they, they, in that case, a recording, ECOG recording, as they, as they refer to this thing, is not very useful. They probably, uh, in those cases, they may put the electrodes deep in, in, the, in, the region, in, in the hippocampus region to record from that area. They, might, they make that decision, you know, you know uh, on their own, and then we just work with the data. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And I think uh, if, if it's really hippocampus area, putting the patient through this exercise is probably useless. It's probably much better to, if they uh, put the electrodes, electrodes in and report from that, in that part of the area. Now remember that these are epileptic patients, right? These are not patients that have casual seizures once every year. These are patients that may have a few, patient, a few seizures a day, really totally destroying their lifestyle. Uh, there, there are some stories that you could read online that there is a child that has like 15 seizures a day. I mean, that is a very tough life to live. But for those patients, these solutions, even though they may sound crazy, they may be their only, their only way have a normal life. Now, from our perspective, this is the data that we have, and then, as you can imagine here, uh, it is very easy as a signal processor to say this is the seizure area, right? You can do the various entropy calculation or some variance calculation, and it's above some threshold, and you can say, oh, yeah, the patient is going to the seizure. Therefore, detecting a seizure is, is somewhat is trivial. Now, that among the questions that you're interested in is to identify what we call a seizure onset zone. So, so to identify the particular electrodes, a particular population of neurons that seems to be the, the source of seizure so that other regions, that they subscribe other regions to go into a seizure. Yes, sir? So I just have a simple question. You monitor five seizures, let's say, for a given you know, subject. Or patient, and then you try to figure out before the full-blown seizure how early on could you predict what was going to happen? Can you just give me a time frame for that? Is it like 10 seconds? Is it like a minute? Is it like uh, an hour? Our objective has been to uh, predict seizure, let's say a minute before it happens. We have uh, come, we have worked on different prediction algorithm for seizure, and then the so define the success of that prediction algorithm if it predicts, let's say, 60 seconds before the onset of seizure. That is not an easy problem to solve. That's a hard problem. And I'll get to that in a second. Sure. There was 60 seconds, you know, is what we decided to look at and then define our success based on prediction of a seizure 60 seconds before the onset. Yeah. I'm just saying many, many uh, patients with epilepsy have an aura beforehand. Yes, and I so, understand, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that aura can often be, you know, made 10 or 20 or 30 seconds before the seizure itself begins. So do you have a way of tracking the aura, and is that distinct population from the cells that are actually involved in the epilepsy? I understand, and I've, I've read about that, but we don't have access to that, to those kind of information. I assume that the neurologists work with the patient and ask them about those things, and then, but we have no information on that, and then we haven't focused on that. Okay. You're right, apparently there is an aura, apparently they're considering uh, canines to train to sort of uh, predict the aura and all that. I understand these are all possibilities, but we don't have access to that part of uh, that particular information. Very good question. Now, for the first part, how am I doing in time? Is it a time? We're on time? <laughs> okay, thank God. All right. Because, you know, as a professor, I could talk for hours and hours, but I do have a flight to catch. Okay. Um, now, uh, what, we, what we like to do is that these are our recordings, and then some 120, 150, 200 channels. And then, and then as, I, as I said before, many of these channels could have nothing to do with seizure because they're far away. For instance, this channel here would very well be far away from, from a seizure zone and not even effective. It looks like it, right? And then we, we can easily determine those channels. 
And then, let's say, if these two channels are uh, in, the, in the region of seizure, the question that you'd like to ask is that, you know, between the two of them, which one was subscribed to a seizure first? And did the other one follow the first one or not? I and mean, that's a question that you'd like to answer. And um, basically, is this, this in the seizure onset zone? And then this one followed that one and then got, subs got, got pulled into the seizure or not? That's the kind of question. And it turns out that this is a reasonably well posed question. And it, these are all time series. And basically, it also can be turned into asking the question of causality. Which one caused the other one, right? And the causality among these electrodes, and, uh, and you know, this is, this is a very well-posed question. And uh, you, know, you can think of it as, if you find uh, the, the electrode that would cause others to supply, uh, that, that electrode would be your seizure onset electrode, right? Now it turns out that this question of causality, which we, we sort of stumbled over it, has been an old question that people have been looked at for years and years and years. And every time you list, you list the people that worked on that, and then you see the Wiener's name, then you get relaxed. You know, okay, this is, must be a good problem, because Wiener worked on that, right? And then, um, and then you go down the list, and then you realize that it also been looked at even more recently. And this question of time series, one causing to another, is a, is a pretty standard question that, that you can ask. Even Banger got a Nobel Prize on that. But of course, he was not interested in neuroscience, he was interested in economics. And he got a Nobel Prize in economics working on this particular problem. And, um, and then he came up with what we call Ranger's causality. And then uh, Hans Marco and Jim Massey and other colleagues of ours uh, basically picked up on that concept and defined an information theoretic ways of defining and, and focusing on causality. Right? And, um, and then later on, our colleagues at Purdue and Illinois took that on and moved on further. And we just said, oh, this sounds pretty interesting. We all love information theory. And uh, this is the formulation. It turns out that you could define something called directed information or causality. We basically said, is this time series causing this one or not? Right? It, it turns out to be a very nice, well formulated concept. I think it looks like this. It is this, as a time series, from uh, samples 1 to n, can be and this is one x and this is the other one, and then you could write it this way as summation of mutual information of, uh, between one time series from one to n, c set. And how does this is going to help you, it's going to show you connection to <coughs> the other time series, condition on the past of the other time series. Basically, this is a measure of predictability uh, and, the, and the causal relationship between one time series to another. All right? And then if you sum it up, from one to n, then you got the total causal relationship between two time series. Right? And then for those of us who like mutual information and information theory, and then if you compare this equation to the equation of generic mutual information between two time series, these two are differ, they differ only in this index n. Mutual information computes the mutual information in the whole sequence and adds up steps of the other sequence. But this one counts them one at a time and looks at the, how much this sequence can, can help you predict this other one. Right? And that's called uh, directed information. Right? And um, you know, it has been, uh, this has been known for a while and a uh, pretty interesting concept related to something that you're all very comfortable with. And you could compute it using entropy similar to uh, mutual information. And then the entropy of the one sequence, then this is called causal conditional entropy of the other sequence, of, of, of this sequence condition the other one. And these are all very well defined, and you could compute all of these things. Right? And it turns out that um, if, um, if you compute this, then in the case of Gaussian data, and the data which are linearly dependent on each other, this reduces to Ranger causality. Now, this becomes Ranger's causality, basically, which is great because many people use Ranger causality, but this is a generalization of Ranger's causality. All right. Now, the, then the, the interesting thing is that 
we don't know, we, we can never assume that neurological data are Gaussian, and we can not assume that they are linearly dependent on each other. They are probably not Gaussian, they are probably not linearly dependent. And all we have is data, and we don't have a density function for them to compute these quantities, correct? Right? Therefore, we resort to uh, data-driven and model-free approaches to estimate this. It turns out that the last few years, many of our colleagues have been interested in uh, estimating entropy and other information quantities using the pure data, right? Therefore, all of these things can be computed using the data, using data, right? And it's not that difficult, it's been known for a while. Basically, if these are our, our time series, we could just use the data over windows of the stationarity and then slide the windows down and then compute, for instance, joint densities between them and then plug those into the entropy and joint entropy and all of these things and compute direct information. Right? Compute and try to measure the causality in these two series, not assuming that data is Gaussian or, or any other thing. So the data because it's a time series that we sample kilohertz, 500 hertz. Basically, these are, again, even though I'm using edge, these are differential. And, um, you, know, and you know, these days there are k nearest neighbor, you know, kernel density estimation, and a number of different uh, options out there to estimate the entropy. All right? Now, if that's the case, then great, then you would have, you could uh, create a graph. These nodes of the graph are the electrodes that represent the time series that, that we, we looked at already. And then the lines between them with an arrow are the directed information being above some threshold. Right? Therefore, this could be a particular graph of a person that is epileptic, for instance. And the, these are the connections. This, uh, or the edge, the, the acronym, all different, you know, different names for them, what we call the electrodes in our case, the location, right? And um, basically that suggests that there is a causal relationship between these two, that this causes that, for, as an example, right? And then um, that's our graphs. Now we have a graph, which is nice and basically summarizes what the data that we have, right? Now, as I said all of that before, and then you can look at the dynamics of this graph when you think about uh, the area right before a seizure, the area during seizure, and the area after seizure, right? This is what we have. These are, again, directed information. The edges are directed. Now, it's interesting that you think, okay, maybe this node is active and then and influencing a lot of other nodes. And you can see here that the, there is very much, very little information flow after the seizure. And again, you know, not pretending to be a neurologist, but then it has been reported by many patients that after a seizure, they're in a very low functioning state, that they're dazed for, for hours and hours and hours, and they're very, they go to a very low activity period after the seizure. Again, this could be a, a sort of explanation of that particular post-seizure activity. All right. Now, and these are the, the graphs that we have. All right. Now, the question is that from this graph, can we sort of, we have this graph, can we say that uh, which nodes, which electrodes were part of the seizure onset? Right. And then you can, you can look at this graph and define a number of different uh, metrics to sort of help you understand and, and measure the activity of particular electrodes. The one that is very easy would be the, the net degree of a node, basically the out degree minus in degree, basically showing the activity of that, that particular node that is trying to reach out to the other node. Yes, sir? So this is only for seizures while they're occurring, but could this be also used to try to uncover the actual connections that are underlying these regions, and what would the challenges be? Like we took samples of these, many samples of, of these connections and tried to figure out common connections between them. You're talking about them uh, where while the patient is not having any uh, epileptic episode? Yeah, because it's, this is like the case when there's a, 
an overload of signals being transferred around the brain. Could, could, and this that, is right. right. This is right. Yeah. And could that be used to sort of help uncover what the actual connections are underlying those regions? Because you're getting could be yes. I mean, that's what uh, people have done, right? Mm -hmm. in, in this in this area, we have this privilege of having for these patients. But these are epileptic patients. Therefore, you may have, you know say these are not typical patients, right? But uh, you could you could but the data is there. Yeah, you could do that. And then again, this is the area right before the seizure. They were not in normal uh, functioning. And then, but there are times way before that that you could do the same kind of analysis. The data is there, and that you could. And, and the rest period, the patient is not going through anything, not even going to have a seizure. How does the connective look like? Yes, absolutely. Percussion. So, what the choice of model? So, you have a discrete time model here. So, for you should, a discrete time model. Mm -hmm. Now, given the fact that there are periods over which nothing happens, and then events can occur, you can also have a thought process model where the, the, there's timing information. Uh, uh, why the choice of your particular model versus a point process model, which might give more timing information? Uh, good question. Uh, we haven't thought of it like that. We have, we have worked with point process models to model activities and fires as an individual. And that was, that's very natural. People have done that for, for decades now. And uh, for this thing, uh, we haven't looked at that. We basically, we look at the, at the continuous time signal that we sampled and the windows right. across. And the, the short answer is we haven't caught it like that. There are some people who develop epileptic behavior after an injury. The brain. Has it been determined whether the focus, the location of the uh, this activity is at the location of the injury, or it can be in a different part of the brain. Has this been determined? I, the, the patient that we have data on, they are not that kind of patient mm -hmm. that have gone through the injury, some traumatic injury, and then uh, had late induced seizure. But in the literature, uh, we have seen articles on that, and. Uh, the, 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 the question that I would have is that the region that has been traumatized, it's possible, let's say, if there's a stroke or something, that the, that population neurons have died, right? Therefore, you know, that, but that means that the area around it are maybe overloaded, and then that may cause seizure. We don't have those patients in our, in our data, in our data set. Yes? I have uh, two questions. So firstly, in regions where independent of when the seizures happen, how stable is this connectivity network? Like, is it relatively stable in time, or...? Okay, the, the problem is that uh, uh, because of the fact that uh, these electrodes are placed near the seizure zones, because they know that the seizure is here, they place the electrodes there, to get most information of that area, we have data only for regions, or close to regions of, of, of affected uh, population, therefore we don't have any data from other hemispheres, let's say, that is not good. But I cannot answer that question in that sense, because you only have the data from the part that is near the seizures. Okay, so but in general, for like a normal person who does not have seizures, <coughs> seizures would you expect this network, this derived network to be roughly constant in time, or is it a dynamic network? I hate to answer that. No, no. Oh, no. Now remember that, uh, you know, when you say, when, when you look at this picture, and this is the area of right before seizure, you know, and all that, you see a lot of changes, you see a lot of dynamics. Do you call, I call it dynamics of the, of the, of the network. Yeah. You calling it instability of the network. No, is that right? No, I'm saying, think of this as a dynamic dynamic network. Yeah, yeah. Do you see such that network, dynamics of the network even when, even a normal person who doesn't have seizures? Or is this? I don't, I don't. I don't want to speculate like that, but I'm... All right. Well, you see, though, yes. when you try to measure uh, what we discussed before, when I'm trying to figure out what part of the brain fire with the functions, you do see if you have this gasket. Yeah, so that they change dynamically, even the functionality that they... Sure, that they're trying to... Different story, but... Yes. 
And, and again, that, that's an EEG, right? Yeah. That's an EEG that you can take. Mobile EEG, the yeah, 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 right. This is a uh, more, yeah, yeah. 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 IEEG, right? Yeah. Yeah. But you're right, yeah, absolutely. There, there, there is activity, there is connectivity, you know. Yes, sir. Um, did you look at how the connectivity map changes during a seizure? I mean, like, the second picture, is that valid for the whole time of the seizure, or does it change? Because seizures are often less than a minute or so, right? And then uh, we have, I, I don't have the data here, obviously, this is just average over, over a window. And um, uh, we didn't focus on that part. That we did. Uh, 120 milliseconds, you know, moving on. Yes, I, I, I did, did the exact numbers I did in the paper, but that's that what I remember. Does this picture be consistent? In other words, in the repeated seizures on the same patient? Do you see yes, yes, yes. For the same patient, you see very, very similar pictures. Patient to patient are different, but for, for the same patient, you see very consistent pictures. Yes, so, yes. yeah. Now remember, we have played with these window sizes a lot because we have seizures of some certain length and we want to slide it and then we played with that number a lot to get a stable number that, that makes sense to us and that that number, that 120 milliseconds, uh, you know, felt like the, the best because you want to deal with the stationarity, you want to have enough data and all that. Yes? So I keep hopping on the same so okay. Is there did you notice any similarities between the patients and the seizures in the regions that expire? Or very that different. different. It's very different. Yeah. Okay. Very. That's one of the problems of the age with epilepsy and seizures is that it's very patient specific, and it's very you're hard pressed to find similarities. Any similarities? That's a sort of a harsh. Because that that might be like an interesting. So if, the, if there are similarities, then that would. Give hints to the underlying structure. That's right, no, I understand, yeah. but it's, uh, it's hard to say any but yeah. Okay, let's just, um, uh, we talked about all of that, and then um, I said all of that, and then this is the pre ecton and then we talked about this particular measure that kind of help us, you know, sort of measure the connectivity and then all that, and then what our game plan was this, and we want to find out where is, how possibly is the seizure onset zone that, that spreads the seizure. And then if you compute this number and then plot it versus the late growth and all that, in, in many patients, a few electrodes popped up as electrodes of choice. They had a lot more out degree than in degree, and then it popped out, and then you could imagine a threshold here and then declare these these electrodes as being your seizure onset from the electrode, okay? And that's what we did. And then uh, the best thing you could do at the moment is check that with your favorite neurologist and then see whether that agrees with the neurologist's perception because they're very experienced in you know, seizures and understanding seizure onset from the And um, that's what we have decided. That, and then it turns out that that is gonna feed into the second part of the work because we know that some of these electrodes are involved in seizure. Now we know that a few of them are responsible for onset of the seizure. Right? Yes? Are those electrodes typically neighbors, or are they sometimes all over the place? Uh, typically neighbors. So again, typically neighbors. That's right. Now, the, uh, therefore, and then it, it matches, mostly matched with the, with the, with the Neurologists, and there were a couple of cases that you disagreed on the one particular electrode. But then that comes the soft side of uh, medical vision, medical doctors, and then you say, but this, we found out this was a seizure onset zone also. And he looks at it and says, yeah, yeah, you're right. And I'm like, okay, whatever. And that is the reality of dealing with neurologists and neurosurgeons. And, uh, but I think question. Basically, you you throw any contextual information out about the strength of the yeah, At this level, yes. Right. But you have it, though. But you, you throw it out. You're yeah. looking at uh, the degrees. That's either there or not. That's right. So how much do you lose that? Probably 
Does anybody go to that? Because they hate this kind of strength. No, absolutely. And absolutely. I had the same question when Tim, you know, was working in the same That's right. I love it. Sure. I had the same question. Again, they're the same. They're the same. Sure. That's right. It's all the same. It's all the the strength of his life. Yeah. Yeah. You could have a weight and drag to that, right? Right. And the question back to you, Sarah's question. You know, you have a sensor which is based on a very complex geometry. Mm -hmm. To what extent you're confident that what you're measuring in an array maps to a certain region of the moon? Because they're over right? So they have all kinds of interactions. So do we understand that from uh, if, if we had recordings from a population, you could do spike sorting and then source separation on that. We don't know that. But they're special they're special. Yes, yes, yes. So you can extrapolate. But they don't put everything on the same page. And the series are not the same competition the way I understand it. So it's very particular. There are definitely yeah. cross-offs between the electrodes because even though I'm depicting them far away, but what extent, but I'm what extent, what extent, to what extent the step of extrapolating from the arrays to the region of the brain, what's the accuracy? Um, our experience is that we have, we have matched the neurologists, and uh, that's all I can say. And it's good to be common, but the neurologists are like what? I say, what no, no, just looks at it. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, exactly. Fast, <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear you. Yes, he does fast, fast, I want that. Absolutely. That's what they do all day. In the literature, is there any, uh, those people who are looking at robots and artificial intelligence, do they find something analogous to epileptic seizures in, in robots? <laughs> it would be interesting to see then what may be causing that. I mean, I don't know to what degree it would relate, but I would. Good question. Good yeah, question. Yeah, like uh, yeah, but it would be a intriguing question, but uh, I don't, I don't, I don't. Know. But good question. I never thought of it. I would never thought of it like this, but a really good question. You know, of course, you could, you could uh, uh, make a canine uh, epileptic by drugs, and then you can measure and then have a lot more freedom in dealing with the regions of the brain of a, of a canine. But these are all human data. Yeah. You know, if you look at your graph, mm -hmm. and you said you have the help of some data and the strength of the data, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So it doesn't make any sense to see the graph. You keep, not just look at the metric of the R degree, but also use the weights of it to see the graph. Is that mm -hmm. have any use or it just uh, we didn't do that. We it's already been at some level we've been thinned out, right? Because we have a threshold, right? And yeah. then we don't show it here in you know, the threshold. Yes, you, yeah, you, you could turn it down further and then sort of simplify it further. That's, this is how we simplify it, uh, by just the, the sheer number of layers. No, I'm sorry, number of edges. But that would be another number. Yes, sir? Yeah, does the spatial uh, distance of the graph here represent the same spatial locations of the electrodes on the brain? No. Okay. So what's the... I my graduate Okay. It seems very scattered to me. I, I know, I know. He gave it to me like this, and I did <laughs> it. Because, it's a very good question, because these are grids, right? right. And they're placed on a, on a surface of the brain, they're, they're not like this. Right, so why not put them in that grid to see the spatial location and see the location that's causing part of this? I, why not? <laughs> I give him his, I give him, you his email address. <laughs> no, but a very fair question, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, we basically did all the link work of saying, okay, what is the average, and then it's like six, one sigma below the average, and then the threshold. The usual the statistical ways of determining the significance. Now, let me go to the second phase of this thing, and then I hope I'm okay. Is it really 4 o'clock? The 3 o'clock now? No, 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 it's 5 to 3. 5 to 5. 5, five. five minutes? Well, you can more, it's up to your schedule. Maybe. Yeah, I know, I know. Okay. Let me move on to the second piece, because that's also an interesting piece, and is an initial result and all that. And you want it, you're interested in predicting seizures. As I said before, prediction is hard. You can't consider the truth. Your prediction is hard. And then let's just look at it. And um, let's look to see what do we know from physiology of, of our brain, and then what are some lessons that we can use in our analysis. 
first decision that we made was that only focus on electrodes that are have to do with CG, right? That's one. Of course, eliminate many of them because there's a lot of processing that you need to do. Second is that among those that are involved in the seizure eventually, you're going to focus on the ones that are seizure onset zone, mainly, mainly the result of our previous uh, thing that we just discussed. Therefore, that already reduces our time series from 250 to 6, right? And then uh, when you talk about, um, when you talk about uh, prediction, you're focusing on the temporal characteristics of the data. And you want to find out is, are we in a, in, a, in a state that you can have a seizure soon or not? And that's a temporal characteristic. And it turns, it turns out that in neurophysiology, people also focus on the spectral uh, characteristics of the data. They have all these bands of spectrum that they, they focus on as being an, an important band for different uh, functionality, for different disorders and all that. Therefore, you also got to focus on the spectral uh, characteristics of our data. And at the end, whatever solution you come up with has to be specific to the patient and then adjusted for the patient, tuned for the patient. And again, we don't have no data, no model, we just have data. Right? Then these are the things. And basically, as we used this as before, if this is a seizure, we would like to, to predict the onset of seizure a minute, half a minute earlier than the onset of seizure. That's what was our game plan. And one of the characteristics of uh, um, these kind of uh, epileptic patients is that they have these spikes that you see in this picture. They're called interdictory spikes. Meaning that the period between two seizures is called the interdictory period. In that period, epileptic patients have what they call interdictory spikes. And neurologists have theories on that. One of the theories that they say is that these are seizures that never happen that they never materialize. Basically, uh, the patient, the, the neurons are getting each other excited, but they somehow this the end, right? And then another conjecture is that these, uh, the number of these um, intellectual spikes is not periodic. It, it, uh, the frequency of it doesn't seem to be too relevant, but there must be a pattern in these intellectual spikes that may lead us to a good prediction. That's the conjecture, right? And it turns out, or the conjecture is that if we are not epileptic, we, would, we do not have interleukin spikes. We, our, our brain doesn't have interleukin spikes. Only epileptic patients have that. Of course, that is hard to completely verify because for a healthy patient, there's never going to be an ECOG recordings of their activities. And uh, basically, we want to focus and we want to basically extract this interleukin spikes. And then, um, uh, based on that, you want to sort of predict the onset of seizure, right? And you want it to be patient-specific. You want it to be patient-specific, but in a systematic way that adjusts some parameters to that. And at the end of the day, you want to look for anomalies in your data and detect the anomalies that would be your seizure, the on onset of seizure, that lead to an onset of seizure. And you want to basically, because of the data you have, you want to adopt your algorithm offline, but then have a real-time implementation of that so that you know, the patient will be, once it, it, the parameters have been set, the patient will go to life, and then this would help predict the situation. And then you want it to be a small form factor that could be implemented and, and be small enough so that it could be placed somewhere near the body so that you could process the data, right? Not on top, but with the positive. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's our that's our wish list. Right? And then this is the pipeline that we have worked on. If I'd be on the top of the skull if you have the right hair group. <laughs> <laughs> For some good work. No, I, I, interesting that you brought it up. One thing that is possibility is that if you remove the skull and then make a, a hardware that is shaped like a skull and then could replace what's called, that could be a great solution, right? A, a, a box hardware that shaped like a skull and could replace the skull. That could be a solution. Or another solution would be to have it somewhere near the body and then the, the, the electrode, the electrodes can be data from This is the pipeline that we, 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 we worked on. Basically, a startup with ECOG data, only from seizure onset zone, therefore five, six, seven of the, of the five series. And then 
put them through some kind of pre-processing, some kind of wavelet based denoising, some kind of a scattered networks that help you focus on transient data and not background noise, um, extract some features, and um, do some kind of dimensionality reduction to focus on the one dimensional metric, and then put that one dimensional metric to some kind of an SEM that looks for anomalies in the data. Right? That's our pipeline that we came up with. And um, now among the, 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 among the pipeline, these are all pretty standards. You know, you can have a number of different ways of doing dimensionality reduction. This one is the one that is most exciting to me. That's a feature extraction from that. And uh, the feature extraction has to do with coherence among these time series that focus on coherence and then create a graph among those electrodes that are most coherent to each other. All right? And um, again, I'm running out of time. But if you allow me a couple more minutes, then I can, I can uh, sort of bring the last piece in. And the last piece has to do with coherency between two time series. See, Prakash, between two time series. You have a time series and a time series. What is, the, what is the, the coherence between them? How can we say that these two time series are in sync with each other, right? That is a concept that is very well studied. It's called the coherence between these two time series. Basically, if the time series were linearly related to each other and Gaussian, this would be the definition of the co 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 coherence. This is cross power expansion density of them at a particular frequency divided by the marginal power spectral density of each of them. And this is called the coherence between these two time series for that frequency, coherence at that frequency. Again, this is appropriate for Gaussian and linear relationship. And as we discussed before, our data is neither Gaussian nor linear related. It turns out that in the literature, you can find another concept called mutual information in frequency, which is defined right here. And that relates to this concept of coherence in the case of Gaussian. If things are Gaussian and linear, this, which is that, it gives you this, right? Therefore, if you, can, if you have data that is not Gaussian, and if you can compute its mutual information frequency, then you have a, me a measure of its coherency that would be valid in the Gaussian case. Isn't that a stationary? Yes, of course, it does. Because Isn't that kind of flying of the of the FBS, uh, that's why you have to have the windows not to be too long, so that I mean, slide them and then, you know, yes. But this, the problem of the stationary is sure. the number of samples always. Right. 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 Yes, you can, yes. But we haven't done that. If you have a processor with web plans, you can set up. That's exactly right, and that is something we're going to do. The reason is that because of the very good that we have, therefore, this has been defined for Fourier domain, but you could have a very similar definition for wavelet domain, right? These could be wavelet representation. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. And we haven't done that. You know? But that, is a, that actually saves us a lot of computation. We don't have to do wavelet analysis and follow by a... Yes, we do that, right? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, this is what we have, and uh, how do you do it? You take your data and you turn it, put in the frequency domain and compute the mutual information, the ordinary mutual information between two time series that are not in the frequency domain. Not a big deal, right? And uh, this is just the fancy uh, Fourier stages representation of, of this data and of the top. This is now our um, you know block diagram of doing it, the data from the seizure on the zone, goes to a discrete Fourier transform. The data is now in the frequency domain. You, com you can compute everything that you computed before and you compute the mutual information in the time series. And it will tell you the coherency of the data at different frequencies, right? Just for fun, you can look at it at the pre cut right before the seizure. That is the, uh, for averaging over the network. That is the, the, sh the shape, meaning that at high frequencies, before the seizure, there is a lot of coherency. Compare it to during seizure, this kind of spreads out all over the place. Compare it after the seizure, post seizure, which remember that was a region that uh, the patient is very calm and very 
that we saw low speed, low mental speed, mental energy, very low physics. Kind of makes sense, you know, physiological. Physio 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 and then that is could be our, our, our pipeline of giving, giving us coherency among those electrodes. And then you could, again, this would be the graph of those, those that I showed you. And then you could put that feature in the, into, this, in, into this particular pipeline. Yes? Would that suggest perhaps, uh, as a, I mean, that's a far fetched uh, thought, but if you talk about preventing seizures, wouldn't there be something like a pacemaker on the brain that would be? detecting these frequency uh, activities and... That's, that's what we're talking about. That's what you're thinking about. That if you can predict, then uh, you can basically divide a particular solution for a particular patient that will try to sort of calm down uh, and sort of uh, basically calm down uh, that, that region, basically uh, depress the region as opposed to uh, excite it. That's the that's the term I've been thinking about. Depressing that region. It should be low fields. Absolutely. Now, this is the pipeline, as I mentioned before, and then basically pre-process, extracting the coherence feature, reducing the dimensionality to a single metric, and then putting that metric into a one class anomaly detection SDM. And uh, at the end, coming up with a decision whether there's going to be a seizure in a minute or some time later, right? And we have done all of this thing, and the performance has been uh, perfect in terms of prediction. But the problem is that we have high false positive, right? In a way, not surprising, because when you're perfect, that means that you're trigger happy, right? And then you have uh, too many false positives. And the, as an active research, Today, last night, I got an email from my student saying that she worked on some of the pre-processing techniques to, to, to reduce the, uh, the noise level, and then she looked at features, not at one frequency, but multiple frequencies, she brought down the positive rate quite a bit before, you know, don't quote me on that, but this is ongoing research. And at the end, we try to, we have done implement these techniques in hardware and show that could have perfect prediction in high positive, false positive. With that, I went over, I'm sorry. Okay.